Okay, good afternoon all. Um, we'll be changing topic uh, from COVID to Alzheimer's disease today. My name is Lewis Penny and I'm really glad to be here with you in Amsterdam, all the way from Bonnie, Scotland. I'm a research fellow at the University of Aberdeen and as part of that I'm part of the Scottish Biologics Facility where we are antibody engineers and we're studying neurodegenerative disease. So my talk today is titled Utility or Threat for Understanding Tau Pathology in Alzheimer's Disease and Aiding Drug Discovery. Dementia is considered the greatest unmet medical need facing modern, modern medicine right now, and I certainly agree with this statement. The global impact of dementia is terrifying. Around the world, there will be one new case of dementia every three seconds, and it's estimated by 2050 that 150 million people will have this disease, and that is an underestimate. Um, it is right. underdiagnosed substantially. The cost of dementia will be $2 trillion by 2030, which again is a terrifying number. Dementia is not a disease, it is an umbrella term to, to capture the, the, the symptomatic syndrome of cognitive decline. And this can take many shapes or form, and it can affect memory, communication, thinking, reasoning, language, mood, personality, sensor and motor function. The most prevalent form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, and that makes up 70% of these cases. Dementia and Alzheimer's disease is considered the most feared health condition in the Western world. And when you see the pictures of the brain and the atrophy, you can understand why. Um, I just learned the other day, actually, that if you want to know how much loss of uh, brain tissue we have when we're comparing healthy brain and severe AD, it is the weight of an orange, and that's about that size, quite large. I will try and keep this brief to get onto the flow cytometry, but we will have to have a brief history lesson. Two major histopathologic hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. They were found in 1906 by Dr. Alzheimer's, one of which is plaques. Uh, these are extracellular to neurons and composed of amyloid, but we will be focusing on the intracell intracellular culprit of neurofibrillary tangles, and these are composed of tau protein. In health, they modulate the stability and assembly of axonal microtubules and they control reorganisation of the cytoskeleton. But in the context of Alzheimer's disease, tau undergoes an aggregation cascade causing neuronal dysfunction, toxicity and cell death. You can see the here the monomers becoming dimers, oligomers, filaments and tangles. And if this was just uh, the case and the number of neurons, that would be fine. We could accommodate for that. We have a large number of them. However, these tau seeds are released and spread throughout the brain, wreaking havoc in a prion-like manner. They move through a, a spatial temporal pattern to connect the networks. And you can see here the BRAC staging of Alzheimer's disease. The area of memory severely impaired. I'm not gonna go over this slide, but tau is a central role in the network of neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative patho that's a long sentence, pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. The central mediator. So through that whirlwind two minutes tour of Alzheimer's disease, I hope you realise that dementia is a big problem uh, and tau is a central role in Alzheimer's disease. And that has been the focus of my research over the last number of years. Uh, to combat that, we've generated a comprehensive antibody panel and it's, uh, our research comes into three themes. One, we want to further the understanding of the tau protein in health and disease, but also look at the immunodiagnostic and therapeutic capacity of these. Currently available are commercial antibodies. They offer limited coverage of the protein, many of which are too low affinity uh, with problems with specificity as well. Uh, so we've spent a lot of time and effort generating a high affinity antibody panel against diverse epitopes, extensively covering the entirety of tau. And tau undergoes a lot of truncations and post-translation modifications, which we need to factor in as well. It is a complex protein for a complex disease. Very briefly, before I promise I will get onto flow cytometry, I just wanted to briefly tell you how we get our antibodies. And it's through the power of the sheep, um, not often used in antibody generation. It is one that I would be an advocate for. Uh, all our projects and there is literature supporting the high specificity, sequence diversity and high affinity of antibody libraries derived from sheep. Um, 
I would certainly advocate the use of it further in research. Uh, we get the PBLs, peripheral, peripheral blood lymphocytes, we extract the antibody DNA and we make an antibody library. These antibody libraries contain billions of clones and we put them into a phage display vector. We use phage display technology to get the antibodies that we like out of those billion clones. And what happens when we introduce bacteriophage to infect these TG1 cells is they encapsulate the DNA and they produce the antibody fragments on their coat, which means that we have viral particles <coughs> exclusively with the DNA matching the antibody protein there. And we can use that to see if they bind to the immobilized target. So it's powerful technology, meaning we can screen billions of clones for those that directly look at confirmations or fragments of our, of our antigen of interest. So we wash off the ones we don't like, we loop the ones we like, we reinfect and we, we sequence our hits um, and we get unique phase binders. We get thousands of these, we take forward the ones with novel sequences and we end up with hundreds of single chain antibodies that we put, put into a bacterial expression system to further characterise. This is, I think, my last slide before we mention flow cytometry, which I do promise. We have hundreds of these fragments. Uh, we characterize them by where they bind. That is by ELISA. And we also look at how well they bind. Um, so for example, this one binds to peptide 11 with a relatively high affinity of 732 picomolar. I should say that a lot of this presentation today has been redacted to protect uh, intellectual property. Um, we're waiting for some patents before we can discuss in a bit more confidence. Yes, we've ended up with a high affinity antibody panel against diverse epitopes that extensively cover the entirety of the protein. So what do we use our antibody panel for? We have a really exciting arm of our research, which is identifying uh, tau biomarkers in blood and looking for the diagnostic utility of these. This is a really sexy area of research at the moment and it is translating not just from the world of science but into real life. Um, we're looking at assays that are now approved in America. Um, that's targeting amyloid, tau, different confirmations of that. They can do it with about 95 to 99% accuracy. Um, the fact that it's in blood means it's very uh, useful clinically. And I do foresee this being you know, part as we look at uh, glucose for diabetes, cholesterol for heart disease, I'm hoping tau and amyloid will be for Alzheimer's disease regularly in the clinic, certainly over the next decade. The other arm of our research is looking at therapeutics and the research for that. Um, and over the last few years, we've been introduced to the, the fine art of flow cytometry, um, and I thoroughly enjoyed learning about that uh, for sure. And it's become a really big part of our research. And the next part of my presentation is just to show you how uh, wonderful flow cytometry has been for our furthering our understanding of Alzheimer's disease, not just my research. So yes, we used a cell-based assays to see how these antibodies can prevent the spread of tau into these cells. We used flow cytometry for that. As I said, this bottom statement, these cells in flow cytometry have been integral for Alzheimer's disease research, but I will give you a very brief overview of these cells first of all. They are hex cells that have been stably transfected with two different constructs encoding tau cyan fluorescent protein and tau yellow fluorescent protein and they're relatively inert uh, they're just within the cell they're quite happy. However if, in the context of introducing pathologic tau seeds to them whether that be from Alzheimer's disease brains, uh, transgenic tau mice or it could be recombinantly made tau fibrils these enter the cells and cause these relatively inert expressed tau in the cells to aggregate. And you can see that they're here in close proximity. And what that means is that we can monitor this. Um, if we excite the, the CFP at 433 under the conditions of vehicle treated <coughs> no aggregation, it emits at uh, CFP emission of 475. But given the spectral overlap of the emission of CFP and the excitation of YFP and the fact that they're in close proximity, as you can see here, due to the aggregation of the seed induced um, tau, we get a energy transfer and this can be measured here. 
and it can be measured by microscopy on the appropriate channels, YFP or GFP emission. But flow cytometry is most commonly used to measure this in a very quantifiable manner. You can see here that a vehicle treated, we have a population here that's relatively empty. But if we looked at one that's been treated with tau seeds, as you can see, we have a high FREP positive uh, population here. It's exciting with CFP, YFP emission, you can see that these have shifted up. And these cells are incredibly sensitive to these pathologic tau seeding. Um, you can see here that 300 femtomolars, uh, femtomolar, uh, of tau derived from Alzheimer's disease brain induces this effect. And this threat response induction is highly specific to pathologic tau. You can see that the vehicle, uh, A here, you can see that the vehicle, alpha-synuclein and proteins from Huntington's disease do not induce this effect, but they're highly exclusive to tau. If we look to B, you can see that this effect is again exclusive to Alzheimer's disease, brain homogenous, nothing in healthy controls, vehicle, the Huntington's disease, brain homogenous. C uh, is a little bit of a difficult one to interpret, but in simplicity, if we replace um, the tau CFP with synuclein CFP, we do not get this response. Both constructs need to be there. And finally, uh, the final part of this validation for research use, you can see here that um, it's exclusive to regions that have tau pathology. Entorhinal cortex is important in memory you can see that it's the effect is evident here but not in regions not for tau pathology or physiologic tau so they're fit for research use and it can be used to answer some of our research questions uh, i will give you probably three four five examples now of how the cell line sorry excuse me <coughs> have been used in the literature to help further our understanding of this complex protein and this complex disease one of the earliest papers from 2015 found that trimers, not monomers or dimers, are the minimal size tau unit that can initiate this proteopathic tau tau seeding. And it's important to know that, that um, it's integral for that disease progression, is this proteopathic nature. Uh, these researchers, they obtained uh, tau units of different size. And you can see here that uh, measured by flow cytometry that trimers is the first tau species, uh, the lowest of that size, that it, um, exhibits this response of intracellular aggregation. Another example in the learnings from this assay um, is that tau seeding is an early event that precedes tau tangles, but seems very logical. You can see here in transgenic mice that uh, measured again by flow cytometry, uh, this tau seeding is evident by one and a half months old and is relatively dynamic. Uh, to change, you know, we have a, a thousandfold change from vehicle there, so it's a nice dynamic range that we get to play with. And we can look at how different therapies and whatnot or genetic manipulations might be able to change this uh, time course. If we just look at immunohistochemistry, which has classically been used to look at tau tangles, we don't see them until six months of age. And it's quite a, a saturated, non-dynamic response. You can see nine months and 12 months looking quite similar. And that's, you can see this in the graph here, a nice saturated phase here and a relatively short dynamic phase. The red seeding is going to be very useful for our, our researchers into tau pathology. So it's an early event, wider dynamic range, and seeding occurs before tangles are present. Great tool for us to use. The app, Exact origins of Alzheimer's disease is quite debated. Um, and tau seeding, because it is a early, it's an early measure of disease, as we've seen, it's before tangles. We can use it to try and help us understand which regions of the brain are actually affected first in this devastating disease. The argument is over whether it's the transenterinal cortex or the locus cerealis here. Um, and tau seeding measured by flow cytometry, you can see by this heat map, and the first tau staging is actually in the transentrinal and entrinal cortex um, and not the other debated region of the locus cerealis. It is also predictive of further tangle development and spreading. You can see here um, as these 
Matt gets a bit hotter throughout these tau stages in other disease areas that are affected at later stages. I think this is a great paper again showing the translational use of flow cytometry and understanding tau seeding in relative to, to real life um, and how it affects the dementia stage of this disease. And this paper, which was from 2020, um, we can see here that as titled, Tau Seeding Contributes to the Clinical Heterogeneity and Progression of Alzheimer's Disease. The study took 32 brains from post-mortem. They looked at the frontal cortex, they made brain homogenates, and they applied it to these cells. And they got a very diverse um, heat map um, of Tau Seeding, normalised to one, uh, a set of positive controls. A very, these all have Alzheimer's disease in them. Uh, exhibited very different responses and what's interesting is in dementia the dementia phase of this disease um, it's very heterogeneous in the clinical level some people will have Alzheimer's disease for 20 years and they'll progress very slowly others will have the disease for two three years and they will go from being fit for work to being severely um, affected by dementia and what's great with this heterogeneity we see with the tau seeding correlates quite well with the rate of decline or the rate of progression here. 18 being severe dementia, zero being cognitively normal. We can see the dark blues taking a long time to progress. And a lot of these red lines um, with the high tau seeding being quite progressive and rapid. And a, a nice correlation here as well. So we're beginning to see a translational use for this assay as well. I will briefly uh, go over this. There's a slight uh, diagnostic use for these cells as well, albeit just in cerebral spinal fluid. Um, a lot of acids are now going to blood and plasma, so there's not going to be too much translational use for this. But we can detect how seeding in the cerebral spinal fluid of those suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this was microscopy based used to detect this, not flow cytometry. It either could have been used. And moving closer uh, back to our research as we've done a, a quick tour of um, how the cells have been used in tau pathology and Alzheimer's disease research is they have been used as a drug screening tool for tau-based therapeutics. This is six, seven um, antibodies targeted different regions of the protein um, and they have conjugated them to magnetic beads and used them to immunodeplete as a model of microglia uh, tau seeds from Alzheimer's disease brain. We can see control IgG here, um, inducing a strong response, did not immunodepleted any tau seeds, and varying responses depending on the antibody. Uh, they're saying that 6C5 um, is a very good mediator and inhibitor of tau seeds here. Uh, I have lots of criticisms. Uh, oh, I can't go back uh, for that paper and the fact that it makes no, there's only a select number of antibodies and what is actually driving or the important factors for removing that seed is it specificity, affinity, is it uh, epitope? There's none of that information there. It is just a, a shotgun approach. Uh, very briefly, I can sh share with you some redacted data uh, from our cell based assays, given we have a much larger panel of antibodies. Um, the use of this tau fret biosensor cell. Um, it's the same methodology as I just mentioned. We mix the antibodies with the brain homogenates and we pull them out using magnetic beads here um, as a, a model of the microglia in that phagocytosis. Uh, we add the resulting supernatant to the cells and we measure using flow cytometry in a quantitative way. And this is a, just a, a, a subset of our antibodies, but it's just to show you that they're all doing different things um, in the shotgun approach of looking at them. And if you wanted to say that ENF uh, could be considered something to look further because they're removing these antibody uh, Alzheimer's disease causing seeds, then that is fair but um, we are researchers we want to know why and how ENF are important and this is not published yet um, and as it says we have to sort a few things out with the IP um, first 
But we've discovered that both epitope and affinity are really strong driving factors that should be considered for terminal therapy, certainly on the level of potency, um, before we even consider you know, trying to get these things to the brain and the, the quantity of these seeds. Um, so on the left hand side, we can see a, another small sub panel of antibodies, apologise, named A to E. They all target the same epitope, these five antibodies, but they have very different affinities here. And we can see the one with the best or strongest affinity in the low picomolar range is the most potent, and the one with the, the least affinity in the high nanomolar range is barely doing anything compared to the negative control of 100%. Th this is to be expected, I would argue. Um, it, that is not something I would have thought to be novel. But one thing that is novel and I think important to consider in this field of research is epitope seems critical factor to consider for terminal therapy here. We have five antibodies in a different subset that are affinity matched. They're all in the high picomolar range and would be considered um, a useful enough affinity to take forward to the likes of the clinic and take further in vivo. They all target different epitopes. Four of them do nothing and one of them is extremely potent here. So it needs to be a holistic approach and it's not just you know a shotgun approach of antibodies. Uh, since we have this lovely panel we can begin to look at the characteristics of what makes out um, a candidate or a lead to immunotherapy. I am getting towards the end of my presentation, but we also use the same cell line and flow cytometry as an endpoint in our in vivo assessments of some of our antibodies as well that we use for academic research. Uh, again, we've used, it's, it's like a circle, we've used the, the flow cytometry in these cells to select an antibody to, to research further in vivo. Uh, we have then used transgenic mice, which you have dosed through the intra peritoneum after 12 weeks. We have got the brains, we prepared brain homogenates, and we added the supernatant to biosensor cells. And we've measured this response again of tau seeding, a key endpoint, uh, by FRET via flow cytometry. And we can see here with this example that we have a negative control inducing around about 20% uh, of FRET positive population, and we have a tau immunotherapy around about 4%. So an 80% reduction there. So it's a key endpoint that can be used to, to help interrogate antibodies that may be useful for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. So it is certainly a, a more novel use, I would say, of flow cytometry. Um, and I've, I have a one sentence conclusion. Uh, flow cytometry has proven a critical tool for further understanding tau pathology in this devastating disease. And it's also going to aid drug discovery efforts and certainly aided our, my research as well. Um, I'd like to thank the entirety of my lab and my PIs and funders as well. So thank you for your time today. Um, <laughs>